let's say you own your house and you want to add a deck in your backyard. Your neighbors get notified that you want to build something on your property and they have you know, a dozen opportunities to inject themselves into the process and prevent you from getting your permit. So that's not a rule of law city, right? That that's rule of the squeakiest wheel. It's whoever complains the loudest will get the most government attention. That's a dysfunctional government. It shouldn't be how we operate. Instead, we should have, these are the rules. If you check the boxes, you get your permits. There's no discretion. It's just, it's allowed and you get it. That's it. Welcome to the Curiosity Podcast, where we go deep on a wide variety of technical topics with the smartest leaders in the world. I'm Emma Dakhun. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Mercury. And I'm Raj Suri. I'm the co-founder of Lima, Presto and Lyft. And today we're going to talk to Sachin Agarwal and Stephen Buss about uh, their organization Grow SF, a nonprofit looking to change the, the policy and politics of San Francisco. And uh, this was a really fascinating conversation with um, on a very important topic that has gained, I would say, international uh, interest. The trajectory of San Francisco gets a lot of attention from everyone now, these days. Uh, Imad, what were you interested to talk to uh, Sachin and Stephen about? My kids just got into like a new school in San Francisco. So I was doing this matriculation at the school and they were like, you know, you're the year of 2036. And after I was like, wow, you know, I've never made a 13 year commitment before, but it made, really made me go, okay, you know, if I'm living in San Francisco for that long, I really should. Yeah. And it's clearly got so many broken issues about it that are political in nature. So it really made me go, okay, I should really care about this. And I kind of, at that point, I, yeah, I, I did go to one of these Grow SF events and I thought Sachin and Steven just really have a have a very genuine common sense approach to this. And I thought we could learn a lot by having them on. And it was a good chat. I was always curious about like, you know, how, how do cities function? How do they make decisions? The story of San Francisco is one of like, you know, a relatively small group of people getting a chance to actually uh, have a huge influence in how the city is run. And, you know, the city has a lot of very clear um, problems. Um, and so I've never chosen to move to San Francisco. You know, I live in uh, Los Altos, a small city, next to Palo Alto um, and Stanford. And I, I have deliberately not chosen. I mean, most of my peers, including you, have, have you know moved to San Francisco and lived there. And we made a choice not to go there because of the issues that were so evident, you know, some of the, the safety issues, the crime, the homelessness, et cetera. And we're like, well, that's not a place we want to raise our kids. And, you know, the questions always come to my mind, like, why? Why is it like that? You know, you have... You know, it's, yeah. it's, you know, the Bay Area is growing so fast. There's so much money here. There's so much smart people moving here. Why the juxtaposition between, you know, the city of the future or, or the, the area of the future, Silicon Valley, and then San Francisco, which seems like it's from, you know, sometimes uh, feels like a third world country. There's this idea of supply and demand because like San Francisco is such a, yeah, the weather is just so good. It's such a picturesque place. There's so much opportunity in terms of jobs and wealth. Uh that like the bar, like you have to make the city so bad to reduce the demand, right? Like in another city, if it like function at all, like San Francisco, no one would move here. But San Francisco has so many good things and I love living here that it just creates this like super high demand for people moving in that like the city can like perform so much worse that like it doesn't have like a market function for it. Uh, which Sachin and Stephen kind of touched on as well. But there's still people living here. Like I'm living here. I'm choosing to live here. Like there's nothing forcing me to do that. So the pain is like worth the <laughs> the benefits, I guess. But it would really be really nice if we just had the benefits without the pain. No, absolutely. Yeah, I, I can totally see. It. I mean, it, it is a beautiful city, and um, you know, it, you know, we we love showing it off to visitors. You know, it, it deserves um, a, a real shot at being well governed. Um, so. Excited to talk to uh, Sachin and uh, Stephen, and uh, we'll welcome them here right now. Excited to have you both here. I think it's really cool that you are really trying to improve San Francisco. Uh, a lot of people just kind of complain and sit back and don't do anything about it. So I live in San Francisco, so I'm really glad some people are doing more than just kind of sitting back and complaining. I'd love to hear, like, you know, 
you started a while ago. So like what got you really like frustrated and over this hump to go like, oh, okay, we're going to actually do something about it. So basically, you know, my background, I was in tech for 20 years. And a few years ago, my wife and I decided that we're going to raise our kids in the city. There's no other place I'd rather live, right? I love San Francisco. And so started to dig in um, to understand how does our government operate? Why is the city off track? Um, so it seemed like a few years ago, things had kind of veered in a different direction. And, you know, when we decided like, we got to invest the time and the effort to like do something about it. Um, and through that process, I met Steven and um, we got to know each other and we had a shared vision. Wait, which year ago was this? I first started getting involved tw- end of 2019. And then it was 2020 that Steven and I met each other. And actually it was during pandemic. So we didn't actually even meet for a long time. It was a lot of late night phone calls and just chatting through, you know, what's going on in San Francisco. Would you say there was any like one specific event or something that happened in San Francisco? You were like, oh my God, we've got to do something about this. It was for you, though, for you. November 2019, Dean Preston won by 120 some votes and Chase of Boudin won by a couple of thousand votes. And people on Twitter were pissed. And I'm like, oh my God, like it's too late to be pissed now. We had to do something before we lose another election. You know, one weird thing is like I'm from London originally. I don't even, like, I don't feel like I cared at all about like London governance. And like when I moved to San Francisco, I don't, yeah, I moved in 2007. I don't think anyone really talked about like, what is the local city governance? And like, I feel like that's maybe part of the problem, right? Like people don't care. And then the people, like some extreme kind of set of the population does care. And then you end up with like extreme politicians. Uh, Is that roughly like why we're in this situation? Yeah. I think that's exactly right. You know, I can't speak to uh, the UK, but at least in America, the nationalization of politics has has moved the focus away from local governance to national governments. And, you know, when you vote for president, yeah, you know, it matters. Every vote matters. But in California, <laughs> it doesn't matter because, like, California is definitely going to vote for the Democrats. So like, why, why even pay attention to national politics here? I tell friends and, and, and supporters, like if it's not happening in San Francisco, I, I don't even know about it. And that I take that super focused approach to city hall, to, to local government. I think Sachin does the same. And I think it's important that we, we fix San Francisco. We focus on local issues that we actually have the ability to fix and stop electing people based on you know national slogans like someone who ran recently was running on medicare for all which you absolutely cannot do at the san francisco level so why is this part of your campaign so when you're saying nationalization you're not just saying people care about national stuff there's like actual politicians running on national issues that they have no power to change in the role that they're running. Exactly. Exactly. Because voters have become, because we pay so much attention to national politics, we've become so focused on saying the right national message and ignoring, like, I'm going to make sure that city hall is less corrupt, or I'm going to make sure that the streets get cleaned. No one talks about that until, you know, until now, now they're talking about it because Grow SF and and our aligned organizations or our allies are, pushing so hard on like, let's fix San Francisco. Just to give a little background on, you know, San Francisco government, you know, what we've identified, you know, all the problems that you see in the city around, you know, housing development or homelessness or, you know, fentanyl dealers, they're all policy decisions. And the people who are in power in San Francisco, they're the board of supervisors. And there's 11 board of supervisors um, that vote on all of these policies. And, you know, especially up until a few years ago, most people in San Francisco couldn't even tell you who their supervisor was or who they had voted for. And so, you know, for us, we we actually see this as a really simple problem in that, you know, most people want common sense outcomes in San Francisco, and they just need to know which 11 people to vote for. And if we just do that, the city will turn itself around. That's really interesting that people are just so unaware of, of their local, you know, city politics. Uh, I, I live just south of San Francisco in, in Los Altos. And, um, you know, I'll say people are, are very politically active here in Los Altos. It's a small town, 20,000 people, right? And, um, and, and there's just way more, um, Way more, I would say, activity, political activity uh, here. And, and people care a lot about even the smallest things that happen, like, you know, putting humps on a road is a, high, a big political issue here, like speed bumps, you know. Everything, everything is a political issue here. And, it's, you know, it takes a relatively small group of people to actually change policy in a big way. 
Yeah, I would love to understand why that is. Like, why are people Raj was fighting more... against the pickleball? Yeah, no, no, yeah. Don't, don't forget your pickleball story, Raj. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I got involved with city politics because you know their tennis courts that they were changing to pickleball, and like there were only a few tennis courts here, so I'm a tennis player. <laughs> I, I play tennis. I to make sure so that we're still. I'm with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I'm exactly. also tennis. Oh sir. Yeah, Stevens yeah, yeah. might defend the pickleball. Pickleball is good so. too. It's just like why uh. don't destroy the tennis courts? You know, <laughs> <laughs> it's like. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I mean, I've got, I've got my small taste of, of the local politics, and I realize it affects you in a big way. But I'm curious, why do you think San Francisco in particular, what, what challenges do you think San Francisco has in particular? Because do you think it's part of the culture, like a lot of young people moving to the city who are less engaged or have less of a stake, you know, in the future of the city versus like maybe homeowners and et cetera. Why do you think, uh, what challenges have you faced in making people aware and making people care about uh, the politics of the city? I think San Francisco suffers from uh, Dutch disease uh, or like the, the, the resource curse. So this is a this is a thing in international um, development where a, a, a country with lots of um, natural resources uh, tends to develop extractive institutions rather than um, you know strong institutions that will build like human capital and and the development of, of people and research and, and and civic society. So anyway, San Francisco we are such an epicenter of tech innovation and wealth that the city has shifted from a, uh, you know, from a, from a nurturing institution to an extractive institution where there's so much wealth being generated that the city can capture. It doesn't actually have to deliver good outcomes because like the money is going to flow basically in spite of San Francisco government. And I think what we've seen and like the reason this is all happening now uh, is the pandemic disrupted the free flow of capital into city hall. And that's when th- people started to notice, oh, things are getting bad. Things are getting worse and we don't have competent leadership. So um, the pandemic was a bit of a, a, a blessing and a curse, you know, mostly a curse, <laughs> but um, it did wake people up to realize we have a city government incapable of running the basics of city, which is keep streets clean, keep people safe, have good education. I like to click around on, on Zillow. You know, I'm, I'm a always Barbie dream house shopping and I'll click on these like seven and $10 million homes just to look around. And the three schools in the area are like one out of 10, three out of 10, two out of 10. Well, I, I do understand how we got here, right? We voted for people who are incapable of running an enterprise who are, who are focused on virtue signaling and saying the right things and not delivering outcomes. So um, all that is to say, San Francisco's unique problems is that we had it too easy. The government didn't have to do a good job. But now that things have turned around and, you know, the tech industry is having layoffs, tourism has been severely impacted from from COVID. It's highlighted the the fissures, you know, the weaknesses in local government. So, like, there's nothing specific about, like, the geography of the city or even the people who live here. Like, San Francisco is just like any other city. The only thing that led to our bad outcomes was it was easy money and the city didn't have to deliver. Yeah, I'll add to that. You know, I think that um, San Francisco might be a little unique in that, you know, local elections are really important and really confusing here. Um, You know, basically, we're a city of Democrats. And so for most down ballot races for like these supervisor races, you've got a Democrat against a Democrat. And it's really hard to know what the difference between these two folks, what the differences are and, you know, who's actually focused on outcomes and who's focused on like, you know, fixing the city and moving it forward versus who's a NIMBY who wants to hold it back and wants to, you know, shut the doors to immigrants and businesses and and tech companies. And what happened over the last 10, 15 years is that the kind of far left anti-growth folks, they took over the leadership of the Democratic Party, the local San Francisco Democratic Party. And they created a voter guide called the League of Pissed Off Voters, which is a great brand. Um, but they basically endorsed all the anti-growth folks and they were winning. And so it was very smart on their part. You know, I mean, that's, that's politics. And so now our job is basically to counter that and to say like, look, you know, we, we're going to break it down for you. If you want NIMBYism and anti-growth, sure, you can vote with them. But if you want the best public schools in the country, and if you want more housing growth, so rent comes down and you want to welcome the tech community and make it easier for small businesses then this is how you should vote. You should follow the Gorosef voter guide. 
And it really just is that simple. You know, so I do think it was like this Democrat versus Democrat dynamic here that's that's made it really tough. I think the whole supervisor thing is really confusing. It's not like it's not just like the mayor that I'm voting for. It's some tiny area in San Francisco that has like a tiny number of voters that can like skew something that happens has a bro. Like, I mean, I get like you want to have like small ish kind of governments, but it's it's a weird construct because it's like you have these sub regions that are then voting one person who's going to affect all of San Francisco. Like it's a, it's just like too much like brain power to like figure out what the hell's going on. Is it like a congressperson basically? Is it like a representative? Yes, but there's thirteen of them, and like it's just San Francisco is a small place. Let's just have one mayor that has like most of the power, or like or whatever. They could have three people there, but like it's just weird to have these sub regions like decide these district. Things. San Francisco, um, it has it has a, a different kind of structure than, than basically any other city in California because, you know, San Francisco is a city and a county. So um, every county has a board of supervisors and San Francisco is no different. So, so we have we have 11 uh, supervisors. And um, if you go over to Alameda County, right, you've got, I don't know, several cities there. You've got Oakland, Berkeley, et cetera. Uh, but there's still only the board of supervisors for Alameda County and then each city has their own. A city council. So the county level supervisors are, they're designed to set policies that benefit the region as a whole. And so they're, you know, they, they have always the interest of the whole county in mind, not just one city or like one neighborhood. But San Francisco, that, that method, that model breaks because basically one supervisor will represent three small neighborhoods and so you, instead of the supervisors thinking about the city's health as a whole, they have very narrow parochial interests where they, they're like, this is my fiefdom and I'm going to, you know, be the king here. And anything that happens outside of my fiefdom, I don't care about, I don't care if it's, you know, saying no to this thing in my district hurts someone next to me because ultimately I care about the 36,000 voters who elected me and not the 500,000 voters or the 850,000 residents of San Francisco. And it, it's this misalignment, this misalignment of goals that lead to much of our dysfunction. Actually, there's a great research paper called Warding Off um, Development or Warding Off Local Control. I forget exactly. It's by Evan Mast. And um, he found that as you shrink the polity, I guess, of your, of your electoral districts, your interests get more and more narrow and your politics get more and more nimby. So switching from citywide elections to district-based elections decreased the amount of, of permits for multifamily housing by 50%. Just, just changing how people were elected, changing nothing else. That speaks to San Francisco's problems. We, have, we elect small, narrow interests to represent a huge, dynamic city, and we therefore get regressive outcomes. It's been very interesting to see, you know, to me about how, you know, the, the politics of the city work. Do you think there's a specific reason why San Francisco has this far left contingent? I mean, San Francisco has now become this case study nationwide for like the far left taking over, you know, the city government. Why is that prevalent here and not other cities? I mean, this goes back to what Sachin was saying. They created a very good brand and they were able to uh, launder their anti-growth, anti-progress ideology through the lens of national progressive democratic policy. And so it, it's not that the voters are far left. It's that the far left had a very good strategy to take power. Uh, and so th that's how it happened. It's a function of like the people in the city and how they organized. Yeah. But I think also like, I mean, a lot of the issues that we're seeing in San Francisco do exist in other West Coast cities like Seattle, Portland, Oakland, L.A., so I don't think we're, we're that unique there. Um, I do want, think one thing that's unique about San Francisco is that, like, we're closer to a lot of the problems in terms of, like, the geography of the city. Like, you know, you've basically got, like, half heights and then, like, you know, a 10-minute walk away, you're in the tenderloin. And so, you know, the problems are just, like, really right there in front of you. But, I, you know, I, I do think, like, a lot of cities are, are dealing with the same issues. But we're seeing kind of a similar dynamic where people are pushing back. You know, I think we just saw Seattle uh, in their last city council election, I believe, voted for a lot of great um, pro-growth folks and, and turned a corner there. 
Um, Oakland right now is is going through uh, a process to recall their district attorney and recall their mayor. So similar to our district attorney recall a couple years ago. So, you know, I think a lot of people have realized like, hey, we've been voting, you know, against our own interests and and we want change. I think there's also like a relevancy of the resource curse. Like, I remember thinking like five, 10 years ago or whatever, X years ago going like, hey, we're so rich here. Why can't we just give these homeless people a house, right? Like, I think in other cities, there wouldn't necessarily be that possibility. So, you know, when when that prop or whatever came around that Mark Boehner for supporting, saying like, hey, let's get 300 million people, uh, $300 million to get everyone a house. I was like, yes, let's, you yeah. know, I mean, I was, the construction of that particular law was bad, but I was supportive of, like, I'm like, I'm willing to give money to help people, right? And I think, I think it is related to that, that there is, uh, people are generous and they want to help and like, at least, the way these policies are packaged are like, hey, let's help the needy and things like that. So I think people get on board with it. And, and that's a really good point, right? I mean, I think people in San Francisco are very compassionate. We want to solve these problems and we're willing to spend as much as it takes to solve them. Uh, right now, the city is spending over a billion dollars a year on homelessness, but we're not seeing results. And the reason why we're not seeing results is a combination of the politicians that we've elected, a combination of uh, the nonprofits that are taking a lot of this money that are like super corrupt. And ultimately, it boils down to not being data driven, not being outcomes driven, uh, and not being able to hold anyone accountable, right? Like, if I say, like, we're spending a billion dollars, and you know, you need to deliver to me results. And if you're not delivering results, I'm going to fire you. Like that kind of process just doesn't exist in our government today. Um, So that billion dollars just disappears. One thing that was surprising to me when I moved to San Francisco is how, like, you know, San Francisco is a county. I mean, it's small. And then a lot of things that we'd want to improve, whether it's housing or transit or whatever, are hard to do as like one tiny city. Like it would be much better if, you know, Marin, Alameda, San Carlos, is that the county below? So San Mateo. Like if we just got together and we we're like, okay, you know, because I take housing, right? Like if, if we don't build housing, like a lot of the homelessness actually gets pushed to Oakland and all these things, right? Like it's, it's not a local problem necessarily uh is there any chance we can get to more of like a bay area thing like can we just enlarge the county and like (laughs) like is there any way that's possible you think like we're just stuck in this kind of motion and there's no one that can like change that i I mean look anything's possible i looked into this and wrote a little piece about it uh, a couple years ago it's called san francisco's over bay city is just beginning and I looked into the history of, of like basically w- what happened in New York City. So they have all the boroughs because those were all independent cities, if I remember my history correctly. And then they, they joined together or, or Manhattan annexed them. I forget exactly how it happened. So, um, th- like there's precedent for it. And in, and indeed in the early, it was the early 1900s, there was an initiative or maybe it was the mid 1900s. Like obviously it's been a minute since I looked at this research. There was an initiative to have the counties all join up. And I think San Francisco was trying to annex Alameda County. And basically, you can do it. What you have to do is you have to get the voters in the county that you're trying to annex to vote to be annexed. And typically, you wait, the way a government will do that is like, if you vote yes on this, we'll make sure like your local city things get way more money than they would otherwise. So you effectively, like you're bribing the, the electorate. <laughs> It sounds worse than it is. Uh, you're, you're promising more government resources for the things that the electorate cares about. That's the proper way to say it. So um, it's possible. That initiative all fell apart because ultimately, like, that's a, it's a really big lift. But I think there has actually been some progress on unifying Bay Area governments into a, a unified regional government in the past uh, decade or so. So for context... There are 101 different cities in the Bay Area. Frankly, that's too many cities. And you get the exact behavior you're describing about. I remember I went to a city council meeting down in, um, it was either Cupertino or Sunnyvale. And they're talking about office development and housing development. And like they approved the office development. And when they said, you know, someone asked about the housing, they said, oh, well, San Francisco can build the housing. But that's what every city in the region does. They all they all want the office because that generates tax revenue and doesn't have any constituent services attached to it. And they don't want the housing because then like you have to pay for schools, you have to pay for you know other infrastructure. So every city wants 
the offices for the tax revenue and doesn't want to build the housing. And that's how we've gotten here. But there are two organizations. There's the Metropolitan Transportation Commission, or MTC, and the Association of Bay Area Governments, or ABAG. They used to be two separate entities. Now they're basically working together. Now it's called MTC ABAG. And uh, they have representatives from all the local governments that meet to discuss regional issues, uh, including transportation and regional housing uh, development planning. So David Chu, I believe, Assemblymember David Chu passed some legislation that gave ABAG uh, a little more teeth on enforcing it. But like, there's still a lot more work that could be done to tie um, state-level funding to uh, good behavior from cities, which could then be coordinated through MTC ABAG, which is all a long way of saying uh, it's very difficult to get to a unified, uh, coordinated response, a, re- a regional government. But we're making baby steps, and I think I think uh, we'll get better coordinated over the next like thirty years. Yeah, just wondering, you guys have this goal, obviously, um, to make San Francisco policy more moderate. How, where are we in that journey? What percentage of the supervisors are moderate by your standards, and what percentage of our policies are evolving in the right direction? We'd love to hear sort of where we are now, and then we'd love to talk about the future as well. So we have 11 uh, supervisors on, on our board. As of two years ago, we only had two folks that were kind of pro-growth, right? They wanted to welcome businesses and tech and build more housing. And we had nine that were you know, kind of far left and you know, really detrimental to the city. Uh, luckily, in November of 2022, we had two uh, supervisors that we supported win seats. Uh, so now we have four good supervisors out of 11. So we don't have a majority, but we're making good progress. Uh, and the next big election for supervisor seats is November of this year. We're going to be challenging all six seats. If we can pick up two, we'll have a majority. And then I think, you know, sky's the limit on what can get done. You know, we'll see some really immediate changes because of policies that they can enact directly, because of commissions that the Board of Supervisors controls. And then that sets us up for the next step, which is to be able to do city charter reform and actually change the constitution of the how the city operates to allow, again, like more growth policies and really, we want to see a rule of law city, right? You want to see a set of laws that govern the city, and then we should enforce those laws. And if you want to do anything within those laws, like start a business or build housing, you should just be able to get it done with, without anyone getting in your way. Let me highlight the, the difference between what Sachin's saying, which is like rule of law city and the way San Francisco operates now. Um, let's say you own your house and you want to add a deck in your backyard. Your neighbors get notified that you want to build something on your property and they have, you know, a dozen opportunities to inject themselves into the process and prevent you from getting your permit. So that's not a rule of law city, right? That that's rule of the squeakiest wheel. It's whoever complains the loudest will get the most government attention. That's a dysfunctional government. It shouldn't be how we operate. Instead, which is what Sachin is describing, we should have, these are the rules. If you check the boxes, you get your permits. There's no discretion. It's just, it's allowed and you get it. That's it. The fact that we've had all this discretionary power in the hands of the supervisors and other you know, commissions is actually what's led to a lot of the corruption in government as well, right? If you know that, hey, I want to build this house, I need a permit, but it's going to be really hard for me to get this permit. Well, now you're going to you know, hire a permit expediter. You're going to slip some cash to someone under the table in order to get that permit, right? Like all that needs to stop. Right. And, and, you know, the federal government did come in, they arrested a bunch of folks. And so there's there's work being done there. But, you know, again, think of frothiness in San Francisco, all the money, all these laws have, have uh, you know, kind of created an environment where this corruption is really rampant. So what are your top priorities from a policy perspective? Like um, if you had a magic wand and you could you know make one or two of these policies happen today, what would you do? What would you prioritize? Oh, man, one of my maybe my top priority right now is we need to be teaching algebra in middle school again. Right now, it's San Francisco is not allowed to teach algebra until ninth grade in the public schools. The private schools can teach it whenever they want. And indeed, some private schools teach it as early as seventh, or I think there might be one that teaches it, offers it in sixth. I don't know how many kids take it. You know, you go down to Palo Alto, they're teaching algebra in seventh grade. So if I could wave a wand, I would say any, any smart kid who wants to learn math should have the opportunity to learn math at whatever age they want. I have a sixth grader in a private school in San Francisco, and she's doing pretty reasonable algebra. And like, I would say actually she's bored if in math, if she's not being pushed. And I don't think she's like some sort of genius either. I just think like 
like kids are capable of doing algebra at sixth grade. Like there is absolutely. Uh, I actually grew up in Pakistan and there I did algebra at the age of like seven and a half or wow. something. Uh, which I guess in what, what grade would that be in America? Like second or third grade? Or something? Yeah, that's really, but it's not that hard. Like as in, I, I feel like this, people think algebra is some like crazy thing. They, like this is like a standard school in Pakistan. Like that was not yeah. like a high end thing. Uh, like, I think it's really crazy. It, it's know? a real way that our government is failing us. You know, during the pandemic, like, this was so radicalizing for me during, during the pandemic, while the public schools were closed, all of the private schools had reopened. If you couldn't afford private school, I, I want to have kids. I can't afford private school. My kids are going to go to public school. You know, uh, Stephen, maybe you can explain something, right? I kind of get NIMBYism. Like, it's like, a I don't like it, but I get the incentives involved. It's like, okay, you know, you want to maximize your house value, so you want to decrease the supply of housing. I just don't get, like, this anti-algebra thing. Like, who is, like, who is incentivized to, like, make schools worse? Like, what is the incentive here? So, like, I'm going to... Uh, I think I'm going to, I'm going to try to steal man, steel it man for it. Us, yeah, yeah. I know it's painful for you but. <laughs> yeah. to, to steel man it. If you believe uh, strongly that some kids are disadvantaged by their particular situation and that they deserve the same opportunities as kids who don't come from a disadvantaged uh, background, but you don't have the ability to, fix the underlying problems what you want to do and this is where people end up is they want to level the playing field and that means get given a lack of abundant resources you're going to lower the bar instead of raising the floor and so like if you want susie and and johnny to perform at the same level but like johnny started here and susie started here your only option is to hold johnny back because you don't actually have the institutional resources to raise Susie up. I think people have, they've been steered down a direction of opposing merit and opposing support for gifted students because they're, they're too worried about unequal outcomes. Uh, and so they'll make... That still seems so crazy to me. I mean, like, we're still going to have unequal outcomes because like, you know, yes. people with smarter, smarter parents mm -hmm. or like people with the ability to go to private school are still teaching them algebra. So exactly. all you're doing is like holding down people who don't have those. Opportunities. And it's crazy. We have the resources to lift the floor, to raise the floor and yep. we're not doing it. That's the crazy thing. Yeah. And it's, it's especially galling because of course, when, when the government fails a rich family, the rich family will move the kid to private schools. When a government fails or, or, leave San or leave San Francisco, when the government fails a poor family, they just get failed. Right. And so yeah. that's the, that's the reality that, you know, we've enacted in San Francisco is that if you're rich enough, you can opt out and you can get quality education. And if you're not rich enough, then like, sorry, you're out of luck because we, we don't value merit in the public schools here. So we have to fix that. I'm hoping to have a, a public school aged child, within about 10 years so if we don't fix it within 10 years uh then well i'm gonna i'm gonna have to go back you know to a to a well-paying job instead of a non-profit <laughs> such and what is your top policy you'd like to reverse yeah you know i think you know as a general uh, area i think public safety is a big concern you know i feel it personally day to day our polling shows it's a top issue for most san francisco voters it's not just about being able to walk out on the streets, but, you know, it affects uh, public transit. We know that the number one reason why people don't use public transit is because of safety concerns. Safety affects businesses. You know, we're seeing a lot of businesses shut down and, and it, a, a lot of the reasoning is around public safety and, you know, some neighborhoods uh, like downtown just not feeling safe and people not going there anymore. And so, you know, luckily we're seeing some progress on this, but, you know, we need to be a city where we're enforcing crime. And, you know, if you break the law, you're going to be held accountable. Thanks to uh, the DA that we you know, supported in the last election, uh, we're seeing a lot of great movement on that front, but there's still more to do. But you know, I, I think in addition to kind of crime like larceny and, and whatnot, uh, something that affects me day to day as a parent now is traffic crime, right? So people blowing through uh, stop signs and red lights and speeding. And you know, with me walking with my daughters to the playground, I need to feel safe and I want them to be safe. 
And right now we're just not doing anything about, um, about these crimes. Um, you know, the last data I saw, um, you know, a few months ago, basic traffic citations in San Francisco have gone to near zero over the last few years. And this is just letting people know that you can go do whatever you want to do and you're not going to be stopped. Uh, and that's just terrifying. We have a police shortage uh, right now in San Francisco. That's something that, you know, folks are working on. Um, you know, we need to hire uh, and retain police officers. You know, we have a police commission right now that's terrible. Um, they have set policies that basically make it hard for police officers to do their jobs. So there, there's a lot of steps and a lot of issues that need to be resolved. I think we talked about this before, Sachin, but there's uh, there's this argument that like, hey, we just can't fix San Francisco while it's a one-party city. Uh and we need like competition. Do you think it's at all possible that there could be a reasonable Republican competition? Like I think New York had a pretty bad state in 1980s, I believe, and they ended up with like 20 years of Republican mayors, which like helped fix it. At least that's what they would claim. I guess my question to you is like, is there a is there a potential for a two party system in San Francisco? Would that be a solution or? Like, it's just not happening and we should just, like, not even think about it. I think there are probably different opinions on this. Like, I, I think with the composition of San Francisco, you know, being so heavily Democratic, I don't think that a Republican has a shot of, of winning here. I also do think that, like, within the Democratic Party, like, we are very divided between the far left and the moderates. It's not that we are, you know, the same except on the fringes. Like, these are really different parties. And so, you know, we've already seen that by electing a few moderates. Um, the city is shifting. And so I think, I think we just keep on that, that path. Now, obviously, if the city had not been turning around, which, you know, again, I think it has been over the last couple of years, and things just got worse and worse and worse, then of course, right, anything's possible, right? People just get to the point of frustration and, and, you know, they'll say like, hey, we need to, to go to the extreme. But, you know, hopefully that's not necessary. I agree. And I think what we're seeing inside the Democratic Party is exactly what Sachin's describing. We've got two factions, which both are, you know, they're very different. And the problem we're having is that because the two factions are all under the same label, Democratic Party, uh, it's hard to tell voters the difference between a candidate, right? In, in, a, in a city with a Democratic Party and a Republican Party, it's easy to be like, well, these are the values of the Democratic Party, these are the values of the Republican Party, and I can pick the one that I think probably aligns with me without knowing too much on the details of your policies. We can't do that here because... You know, we basically everyone here has Democratic Party values, and they'll just pick whoever is endorsed by the Democratic Party, not understanding that some of those are communists and some of them are moderates. <laughs> you know, it's it's it, the, the the factions in San Francisco Democratic Party are so far apart. So I think there's something that we could do to to better signal the differences in the factions, like maybe adding something to the ballot that's like, yeah, I'm a Democratic Party and I'm part of you know this branch of it. So you could be the progressive Democrats, or you could be the liberal Democrats, whatever. So I've been watching the stats on the Republican Party in San Francisco for, I don't know, the past 10 years. And it is actually growing, which is, I think, maybe surprising for a lot of people to hear. Like, well, it's grown from 1% to 2%? <laughs> no, no, it's more than that. It's like 12%. <laughs> but like, there's an upstart faction of the, the SFGOP Brioni Society. And they're like, they're like the never Trumper branch of uh, of the Republican Party here, so they're trying to shift the the GOP away from national GOP rhetoric and focused on you know on on local issues. They might have success. I don't know. I mean, it's a pretty bad. The Republican Party has a very bad branding problem in San Francisco, so who knows if they'll succeed? But um, you know, at least they're they're not like the um, they're the more sane. Uh, faction. So I wish them luck, you know. The, you know, another interesting, uh, you know, situation in San Francisco. So we've got 20% of voters registered as no party preference. You know, so you've got these folks that are like, oh man, I don't like the, the Democratic Party, it doesn't represent me, so I'm going to be, you know, an independent. And now what that does is it actually takes some of your voting power away. Because as an NPP voter, you cannot vote for the leadership of the Democratic Party. So going back to something you were saying like earlier, that's what causes these kind of extremes, because now you've only got, you know, these extreme Democrats voting for the leadership of the Democratic Party and, you know, the same on the right side. And all these people in the middle who just want the city to work, you know, they're not able to vote in these races. And so one of the programs that we ran in, over the last few months is to message to no party preference voters to tell them, hey, look, 
like it's really important for you to vote for the leadership of the Democratic Party in San Francisco because we are a democratic city and the, you know you only have a say if you are a registered Democrat. Uh, and that was really successful. We got thousands of people to re-register. We're optimistic about that being another way to kind of move things into a more reasonable space. Yeah, it's it's pretty funny. We registered more Democrats in the past three months than the local Democratic Party has in the past five years. It's, it's pretty pretty great. <laughs> How many people have you managed to mobilize through Grow SF? Like, and just in general, I'm just wondering what the what the overall numbers are. I'm sure you probably keep track of this. Like, your, what's your KPI in terms of like voter mobilization, and how do you track that? Yeah, so we've been around for uh, about three and a half years now. We've got you know tens of thousands of people on our email list, and you know tens of thousands of followers on Twitter. But what we r- do really well is um, around every election, we run a super PAC and we use our super PAC to basically distribute our voter guide and our endorsements to all voters in San Francisco. Just some rough stats, you know, for the November 2022 election, we sent over uh, a half a million pieces of mail. So we sent our voter guide in English and Chinese to all voters. Um, we ran a large campaign on Facebook and Instagram. We had Google search ads. So if you search for any election related keyword um, or candidate, you know, we would appear um, and our voter guide, you know, we really pride ourselves on providing fair, well-researched, accurate information so people can make up their own decision on how to vote. So in November, we had uh, literally 400,000 views on, on our voter guide uh, just over the course of those 30 days uh, when people were voting. So, you know, we were, you know, basically hitting every voter with our message. One of the great things I, I love about what we're doing at Grow SF is, is we don't, we're not actually trying to change anyone's mind. What we know, like we we run polls to figure out what do people want? Like, what do they say they want? And then we, we take that and we look, we compare it against the outcomes that we're getting. And we say, okay, well, people, if you, when you ask them, people want more police, people want better schools, people want cleaner streets, they, they want to arrest you know, fentanyl dealers, but we're not getting that result. So all we have to do is say, well, you want these things, we agree with you, and if to get those outcomes, we think you should vote this way. So, um, all of that has led to us moving about uh, 20% of the vote in San Francisco. We figured this out through some statistical analysis of the Department of Elections data, and uh, we were pretty confident that we move uh, about 20% of the vote. The Democratic Party moves about 14%, um, and then every other group uh, move, moves you know, less. Uh, I'm, I'm proud to say uh, we have reduced the league of pissed off voters down to uh third place they used to actually they moved more votes than anyone else in san francisco until voters started to realize that they were the league was this extremist far left organization leading us down a terrible path every election that i've been tracking since i got involved in politics uh, in 2016 they have lost ground so that's great it's great news for the city and, you know, it's like really interesting to look at the, the two strategies, right? So the League of Pissed Off Voters, you don't know who they are. Like you literally don't see any faces or names behind them, who's making these endorsements, who's backing them. And with GRSF, like we're the opposite. We're, we're extremely transparent. Like you know who Steve and I are, who's on our team, who's on our board. Our endorsements are well-researched. We put our reasoning like on the voter guys. So you can read how we arrived at our, you know, recommendation. And that's what our goal is with all of that is to build trust with voters. So you don't just get a piece of mail or see an ad and you're like, okay, I guess I'm going to like vote this way. Like you actually have to like understand who Grow SF is. You know, we publish a weekly newsletter. We're putting out other content so that you're like, okay, I align with what, you know, future Grow SF wants to see. So I'm going to, you know, use their recommendations. And then even better yet, I'm going to share their voter guide with my friends and my family. Um, Because that goes a long way, right? When someone tells you, hey, I trust these people. Now you're going to trust us as well. Um, And so every election... Our goal is to just move more and more votes. Yeah, I think you guys are doing great work, and I'm really pleased that you're out there. I worry a little bit that like you guys and other people in SF are going to be really pissed off because like it's reached such a crappy extreme that we want to fix it. But what happens in like five years time, where you know everyone else goes back to their busy lives? We're like, okay, finally we got like you know algebra back. We have like basic crime being uh, being kind of prosecuted, et cetera, and maybe we're slightly more yimby. Uh, and then, you know, five years' time, we all go back to our normal busy lives and stop paying attention to SF politics. And then, you know, more extremist elements, like maybe it'll take eight years because we're so annoyed. But, like, is this just a pendulum that kind of swings back and forth, basically, is my question. I, I guess I'll have a general and a specific answer. 
all politics is a pendulum. In every democratic society swings left and right. It is the natural course of voters making experiments. You know, they're, they're like, oh, we think this is a good idea. Let's try it. And it doesn't work. So then you, you go back the other direction. You know, it's, it's always a pendulum. So that's the general answer. The specific answer is San Francisco voters have never been paying more attention than they are now. That's why things are changing, right? People are upset. They're paying attention. We're voting differently. And the way to ensure that we don't backslide is to make it so that, number one, we deliver on our promises, right? We can't elect people who then fail to do what they said, uh, because that way, you know, we're going to, we're going to lose again. And the voters deserve better than to elect people who do nothing. Number one, deliver on what we promise. Number two, ensure that we continue to produce the best deeply researched voter guide. You know, maybe maybe in like uh, five to ten years, all Grow SF does is a voter guide, and like we don't have to do anything else. That'd be great. You know, that's that sounds like a much more enjoyable life. I'm kidding. I love doing this. I couldn't do anything else. But it's possible we get there, and all we need is voters to know. You know, this organization does the work to understand what the impacts of the ballot uh, initiatives are, and the and who what people running for office actually believe. And like, that's enough. I actually do truly believe that. I truly believe that good information is enough to run a good democracy. I don't worry too much about us backsliding and back into extremism. I, there will be swings, but we're going to, we're going to hold the center. I think also, you know, right now the swings, you know, between like the far left and, and, you know, common sense are huge because we have so much government bureaucracy and red tape and these things, you know, discretionary review on things like housing permits and all these commissions that it gives a lot of leeway for how government's operating, you know, functionally or not functionally. If we start to edit down the city charter to cut the red tape, reduce the number of commissions, like you might have a little bit of jitteriness of like, oh, we elected this person or this person, but the Delta might just be here and not here. Now, of course, then, you know, we could, edit the city charter again to create all the commissions. But now you're looking at like a 20 year cycle, not an eight year cycle. Um, so I do think we can kind of break, we just bring it in a little bit tighter um, and that'll be good for us. Awesome. Uh, really appreciate you coming on here, Sachin and Steven. Yeah, it was great. Uh, it was great to Pleasure to be here. On this. Hey, nice job guys. You guys are doing some great work. Thank you. Appreciate it. So hopefully, hopefully this podcast can mobilize a few people. November, 2024, we're going to flip some seats. So let's go. But first, March 2024, ballots will be arriving within seven days. Wait, what's happening today. in March 2024? Oh, that's the Democratic County Central Committee election. That's for the leadership of the Democratic Party. But you only get that if you're a registered Democrat. Democrat, right? yeah. There's still time. You, register, you can still register, register as a Democrat. Really? I really hate labels. I know, me too. <laughs> like I, I really hate labels. I get it. But registering uh, as a Democrat is the number one most powerful can you thing register for you can do. sf democrat or does that put me as like the national democrat as well it's yeah it's the national but like but, the but party imagine, label, after, it, after the election you can you can register independent again you can unregister <laughs> i'll do a seven day registration you could go back to no party preference if you like but like just being a registered democrat doesn't mean you have to agree with everything democrats are doing right and, and in fact i know but it's like a public label right um like it is public yeah sure but but you know there's there's nothing yeah, there's something i find annoying about labels that's fair uh but i get i get it i mean like it's an important thing and i should probably get over that uh all right cool uh, we're overrunning a little bit really appreciate your time uh and yeah thanks for thanks for coming on so that was a great chat really went deep with Steven and Sachin. What was your favorite part, Raj? I, I just love how deep they're going on this problem of how to move votes and like how to, you know, they've identified a root cause, which is uh, two major root causes I, I got from that, which is like um, a the Democratic Party leadership has an outsized influence in that they endorse a candidate and, and most people just vote with who the, the party leadership um, endorses. So there's like a, a mini election that kind of decides a bigger election, which is like who, who elects the Democratic leadership. And then most people don't know when they read these ballots, they don't know which of these candidates agree with them more. So Gorosev is like publishing these lists of people who are basically agree with 
these kind of more moderate uh, set of policy ideas, and which seem to be, you know, a majority of voters seem to ag- agree with already. So I can totally understand. They're trying to fix a problem in the democratic process, which is like people just don't know what they're voting for. Um, and they're not as engaged as they should be. There's this element of grandstanding that like people are like kind of cutting their teeth in like, you know, and the SF board or the SF like uh, school district or and they're like trying to make this change that like, you know, oh, we must be great national politicians because we're talking about like, you know, all of these national topics that have nothing to do with improving San Francisco. And you see this, like even this algebra thing that we talked about, like that's literally someone trying to make like some equity argument and try to like make a stand and like improve things uh, or think that they're improving things, but they're like just like grandstanding basically and like hurting people. Yeah, you know, there, there's definitely an element of that. And San Francisco, I mean, it has a rich tradition of like progressive politicians, right? Like, um, so, you know, we didn't really get into that. But like, you know, obviously, you know, you have um, people like Harvey Milk and, uh, you know, Nancy Pelosi, Dianne Feinstein. I mean, I think they were all like leaders in the progressive movement back in the day. Although I, I, was, I would say Nancy Pelosi and Dianne Feinstein became more moderate or, or maybe they're seen more moderate uh, now. But there's a rich history, I think, of uh, San Francisco being the leaders in, in like progressive politics. And, and progressive politics, I think, you know, they make some mistakes and they, made, they do some things really well and they do some things really poorly. And I think it's a little bit of like the risk taking we see in the tech culture, right? In the tech culture, you got to move fast and break things. You make some mistakes, but you get some things really right as well. Some things like algebra, like not you know being banned until like high school is clearly a mistake. But like, there's other things that progressive politics do figure out, and everyone's like, "Oh yeah, you guys were, you guys were like, you know, gay marriage." Like, yeah, okay, I, you guys were right about that. One positive way to look at it is like, San, yeah, America is this kind of pool of experimentation, <laughs> and exactly. like San Francisco is the far left experimentation. There's probably like some some city uh, that's doing far right experimentation, and like we end up with like seeing like, hey, it's not working, and. Clearly, San Francisco is not working right now, but at least we experimented, I guess. I think that's a big reason why San Francisco gets a lot of attention, right? Because it's like, you know, it's clearly running these experiments. Everyone's like looking at them and then both sides are using that as like ammo, right? Oh, yeah, look, leftism doesn't work because you have all this homelessness, right? It is really interesting to see like how San Francisco become a case study. Because of this kind of fractional nature of you know, the way the San Francisco work with, where there's these districts and the small amount of voters that move things and then there's the SF Democratic Party and there's a small amount of voters that move things. Like, it ended up in this kind of bad place, but also reversing it is actually not as hard as it could be, right? Like, you don't have to move 100,000 voters to, like, reverse the situation if you can be very targeted the way that Grow SF is being. One of the things that I like about that conversation is it it doesn't feel hopeless, right? It's not like, hey, we have to move all of this artifact like it's kind of a fragile system so the you can apply force to the fragility of it so let me ask you i mean as a san francisco resident i mean i asked them for what are the top priorities to fix what are your top priorities that you'd love to see fixed in san francisco i think just like some common sense crime stuff would just really make me feel a lot better about san francisco you know every single person who lives in san francisco has a story like i'll give you quick two ones two stories i had an office uh in kind of seventh and Folsom and someone would come in every single day and steal packages every single day. And I had the police. I was like, Hey, can we just like, you know, stand outside and they'll come in and arrest them. And they're like, no, sorry. It's like less than 2000 per package. I'm like, who cares? Like they're doing it every day. Like the cumulative loss is clearly more than 2000, but it's just, I mean, it was obviously like a crime ring as well. It was always someone different. Like we had a camera going so we could see them. Uh, I mean, that's one example. Another example, Fatma was at a sunglass hut and like someone just came in and stole a bunch of sunglass hut. And she talked to the attendant there and they were like, Hey, every, every week someone comes in and steals the stuff. So I think there's like, this idea that, oh, it's petty crime and no one's getting hurt doesn't make sense when, like, it's, you know, they're doing it over and over again. And, like, you, if you don't persecute the one case, then you make this, like, incentive to, like, there's just no consequences to crime. Uh, it's crazy. It's I would insane. just love for just comments. And it's still happening. Yes, there's a new DA, but, like, I hear stories like this still every, every week. It's like, someone's, you know. And this isn't, like, someone on social media. It's, like, friends or like us directly experiencing this so this is just rampant uh, and it's just so dumb it's so painfully dumb <laughs> you know this 
no rational person would think this is the right way to do it, right? Like, a, like I kind of get like even the algebra thing. I don't, but I, I, like in NIMBYs, I get like the rational perspective. Uh, but this is just clearly one hundred percent of people agree it's like not the way it should be. Most cities in the world, you would hope, most developed cities would not accept that behavior, right? Like that sounds like you know third world country behavior. You know, basically, people you have to start hiring their own private security, right? There's no other way to get. But you can't. That. I mean, it's even worse than that. Like they are not allowed to have like the private security actually has another the story i was at a safeway someone came in took an ice cream the private security guy was like okay you know can you leave now and they just walked off with some ice cream i mean there's just a bunch of kids a couple of kids they're probably high or something uh i'm like what the hell's going on like the, the, the private security can't do anything about it uh so it's even worse like i feel like in a third world country yeah they'd hire, hire private security and like you wouldn't mess with them uh because they'd be a consequence like it's constructed to have no consequences against these people which is insane that, that is absolutely insane so so we wish these guys good luck um you know in, in trying to change um you know the policy of this of san francisco to make a lot more sense i think everybody in the bay area would benefit from a healthy san francisco um that had less crime and homelessness and um you know, less drug problems, etc. San Francisco is like, I would say, and obviously I'm a little biased, but it's like unusually important, right? Because uh, it is the main city in Silicon Valley and like that attracts young people. So I think a better San Francisco is is better for the tech industry and it's better for America. And then you have this other thing where like the politicians in San Francisco often end up being pol politics, doing politics on the national stage. So I think fixing San Francisco is like a, even if you and Los Altos <laughs> and like feel good, feel good about not having to deal with San Francisco, like these these things have like I think an outsized return, absolutely outsized impact. I agree with you. It's high stakes, and um, that's why we hope these guys, you know, make some progress. And it would be a win for democracy if they can. You know, if they can educate people and get people motivated. I think uh, you know, as you said, most people can agree with these types of property crime. You know, rampant, um, acceptable rates of property crime. So. Cool. Well, that concludes our episode today. Thanks for tuning in and, um, you know, feel free to subscribe to us on Substack. All the different channels, wherever you're listening, like and subscribe. Uh, appreciate your support.